Hi, I'm Peter Kutosh, and I'm going to present the paper on the isogeny problem with portion point formation, uh, which is joint work with uh, Paco Boris Wotza, Simon Philip Metz, and Jan Bloti. So, our main contribution is that there's an algorithm for finding the secret isogeny <clears throat> in essentially any SIDH type scheme, uh, given the anamorphism rings of the starting and the target curve, uh, and utilizing the torsion point information in a meaningful way. Previously, this was only known when the isogenies uh, were particularly short and did not utilize the torsion point information at all. Our attacks uh, actually help <clears throat> in analyzing the security of P side and show that the uh, these side partners are tight and they cannot be lowered uh, without uh, uh, breaking the parameter sets. Isogeny based crypto is a branch of post quantum crypto, and it's based on the hardness of finding isogenies between super single curves. Um, however, in most cases, <clears throat> isogeny based systems are, are based on relaxations of this problem. Um, Namely, for example, in SIDH, additional torsion point information is provided. Isogeny based systems are, 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 um, uh, have the nice feature that they have small key sizes. So their uh, public key cipher text uh, signatures are all small uh, compared to their post quantum alternatives. So let me present uh, the scheme SIDH um, <clears throat> in some detail. So let n1 and n2 be two large smooth numbers. Um, usually they're powers of two and three, but that's not quite necessary. And uh, p is n1 times n2 minus one. Uh, sometimes there's also a small cofactor there. Uh, and uh, the starting curve is uh, defined over fp square. And then uh, Alice's secret is an isogeny going from e0 to a curve uh, ea. And Bob's secret uh, is an isogeny going from e0 to eb. Uh, however, just knowing the codomains of these isogenies is not actually enough to, to find a common shared secret. So what they do is they reveal extra information, namely Alice reveals uh, the action of her isogeny on, on Bob's torsion, point, uh, torsion generators, and Bob does the same uh, with his secret isogeny. And then they both can actually compute <clears throat> the curve E over AB. Uh, where A uh, corresponds to the secret kernel uh, of Alice and B corresponds to the secret kernel of Bob. And then their shared curve is the curve EAB. So in SIDH, uh, these isogenies are, are rather short. So, so, so since N1 times N2 is roughly P uh, and N1 is roughly the same size as N2, then both are roughly the size square root of P. And in general, uh, if you restrict yourself to powers of two and three, uh, you do not expect uh, such short um, isogenies to exist uh, between two random super single curves. So the main contribution of P side is to use a different type of parameter set, namely where N1 is roughly N2 and it's roughly P. Uh, so this is achieved by choosing a prime such that P square minus one is N1 times N2 times some small cofactor. Uh, to make this scheme efficient, one actually has to work with curves and their uh, twists uh, simultaneously. So a twist of a curve is actually a curve that's isomorphic to the curve uh, over the algebraic closure, but I, not isomorphic to the square. And, uh, <clears throat> and the main trick here is that you can actually carry out all the computations of the square, and you don't have to go to uh, a few to the fourth uh, in the computation. However, finding parameters for B side is much harder than for SIDH. Uh, so you can no longer actually expect uh, N1 and N2 to be a powers of two and three. Uh, you can make them smooth numbers, but it's uh, it's a lot of work and uh, they're much less smooth than, than inside the H. So it's slower than SIDH, but uh, it has some nice features. So for example, keys are much smaller than inside the H. And now let me rec recall some hard problems in, in isogeny based crypto. So we have a pure isogeny problem. When it's given uh, when it's given two curves and what has to compute an isogeny between them. <clears throat> then you have the SSIT problem where uh, not only the two curves are given, but also degrees specified at one between two of them. And you also know uh, the action of the secret isogeny on some portion. And the goal again is to recompute uh, the secret isogeny. Uh, finally, you have the endomorphism ring problem, uh, namely one is given a super single the curve, find its endomorphism ring. And this endomorphism ring has a very particular structure. So every super single curve 
and it has the property that this endomorphism is actually a maximum order in certain Cartesian algebra. And um, this correspondence was first discovered by Doring uh, back in the 1930s. And it's a really nice correspondence because for it's a categorical equivalence so where many of the notions in the, ISO, uh, the optic curve setting have their counterparts uh, in the quaternion setting. So for example, uh, a super single optic curve defined over P square corresponds to the maximum order in the quaternion algebra uh, ramified at P and infinity. And isogeny going from E1 to E1 corresponds to a left ideal of the first endomorphism P, which is denoted by O1, which is also simultaneously a, a right ideal of the second endomorphism P2. In particular, when theta is a separable endomorphism, and this will correspond to a principal ideal of the endomorphism. Um, <clears throat> so finally, the, the set of isogenies uh, going from E1 to E2 have some structure, and you can add the isogeny between these curves. This is denoted by home E1, E2, and this is actually a, a rank four uh, Z lattice, both in the isogeny and the current setting. An interesting algorithmic property of the Dorian correspondence is that it doesn't have the same difficulty in, in both directions. So actually uh, computing uh, the anamorphism ring of super single optic curve is supposed to be hard. So there are only exponential time algorithms for this fact. But if one is given a maximum order, then one can actually compute uh, the corresponding uh, elliptic curve in polynomial time. <clears throat> so now I will give you a, a brief um, discussion how, how uh, the reduction from endomorphism computation to isogeny computation works. So actually in the quaternion setting, finding a connecting ideal is easy. However, if you want to translate it into an isogeny setting, you need one of smooth norms. And this is exactly what the, the, the algorithm of Coel, Lauter, Petit, and Pignol, uh, abbreviated KLPT, does. So it takes a connecting ideal and computes an equivalent ideal of smooth order. And uh, the so this is a heuristic polynomial time algorithm. And uh, recently it was shown by Veselovsky that you can actually remove the underlying heuristic and replace it with something much more standard, uh, namely the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So how does the, the general reduction work? So, so now suppose that I know the endomorphism ring of both curves. Uh, how can I compute an isogeny between them? So I compute a connecting ideal, then I uh, compute an equivalent ideal uh, of smooth arm using KLPT, and then there is a generic procedure how you can translate uh, uh, a connecting ideal to an isogeny. So, however, <clears throat> in, in, in SIDH type schemes, which is SIDH or B side or any, any uh, variation of SIDH. You have one particular secret isogeny, that's your secret. So it's not a priori clear that if you know an isogeny between the two curves, you can actually also compute the secret isogeny. And uh, the first results in this direction was, was by Galbraith, Petit, Shani, and who showed that in SIDH, you can actually uh, find the secret isogeny in polynomial time if the endomorphism rings of the E0 and the A are also known. And the key ingredient is that is this again this fact that in SIDH isogenies are, are short in a sense. So namely, how does this algorithm work? So you compute a connecting ideal. You don't need to smooth it out; just any connecting ideal. Will do. Uh, <clears throat> then you you find the shortest vector in this connecting ideal in LOL, and then with a really really large probability, this will actually be just the secret isogeny uh, in SIDH. So this uses the fact that usually if you just have uh, two curves, then the, the, the smallest element in this lattice will have more than roughly square root of P. Uh, <clears throat> which is no longer the case, for example, in B side or maybe other variants where the isogenies might be longer. So this, this, uh, this attack doesn't apply to those, uh, those variants. So our main goal is actually to generalize this algorithm uh, to be able to handle arbitrarily large uh, isogenies. Uh, but with, uh, so the previous algorithm didn't use the torsion point information at all, just the fact that the, the isogeny is particularly short. We'll be using the, the torsion point information in a much more mean, in a, in a meaningful way here. So again, we start with an LL reduced basis of the connecting ideal, which we denote by WI. And then these have uh, isogeny counterparts, which we'll denote by phi i. And then we'll be looking for the phi as a linear combination of these isogenies. So this is sum of, i x i phi i and we're looking for the x i. Okay, so we know uh, we can evaluate the phi on the n two torsion. So you know what phi p is, 
So we evaluate both sides uh, here of this equation on Q. And then, um, so, so now we have four equations and we have uh, four variables. Uh, but this system is not linear. However, it can be turned into a linear system, uh, namely by using pairings and uh, solving discrete logarithms. Uh, solving discrete logarithms in this context is not hard because usually n2 is smooth. Uh, plus, uh, if not, but in most applications, n2 has to be smooth. But if, uh, if not, then you can invoke the fact you can use a quantum algorithm for solving discrete logarithms. Uh, and then, so you actually have now a system for four equations, four variables, module one, two, and you can retrieve the, the XI module one. Two here. So there are actually a lot of un unanswered questions uh, with this approach. Uh, the first one is how do you evaluate the phi i? So, so those phi i, they correspond to some abstract equations, which are a corresponding LL basis of the connected ideal. So there's no guarantee that they're normally smooth. So, so, so how can you actually evaluate these phi i efficiently? The second one is, uh, it's clear that the system of linear equations has a solution because there is, there is a correct xi that corresponds to the But why is this uh, uh, solution unique? And the third one is, okay, so I know the xi module went to, how does this help me in finding phi? So first, uh, how we evaluate non-smooth degree isogenies uh, between two curves of known and the morphism ring. So the key ingredient is actually an algorithm by Putty and Lauter, which uh, deal with the special case where uh, you have a curve of known endomorphism ring and you want to evaluate an endomorphism that might not have a smooth degree. So the key idea there is essentially you can represent it as a linear combination of endomorphisms, which, which are evaluatable. And then you just evaluate those and then use the linear combination to evaluate the, the non-smooth degree one. And we'll be reducing to this fact. Uh, <clears throat> So at ji, the, uh, uh, the, the left ideal corresponding to this phi i. And, and the main idea is, is to use KLPT to compute an equivalent ideal k uh, uh, between O1 and O2. So the main component here on, in the isogeny setting is the following. So, so you have an isogeny phi i that might not have smooth form, but going from E1 to E2, then from E2 to, to E1, you compute the smooth degree isogeny using KLPT. And then if you compose the two, you get an endomorphism of the first curve, which you can evaluate using Putty Lauter. And then essentially you just have to cut off the part uh, of the smooth one, and then you'll get the evaluation uh, of, of, the, of the phi i. So this is exactly what we do here on the Pythonian side. So, so you compute the, the product of ji with the, the conjugate of k. So this is just the k and the, Corresponding to the dual of, of that isogeny, which will be a um, um, <clears throat> principal ideal since it's a separable isogeny the first curve. And then uh, the main component here again is that you can evaluate uh, these theta i now, and uh, you and then you can evaluate the phi k as well because it has some use theta. And then you have to multiply with with the inverse of m because when you cut off, you you added uh, multiplication by m there. So that's why it is crucial that the norm of M is co prime to N2 for this to work. Okay, so now we can uh, evaluate non smooth degree isogenies. Why is the solution unique? So, even though there are many different uh, non isomorphic maximum orders in the quaternion algebra of EP infinity, they all share one common thing namely, if you reduce them modulo N2, you always get the same thing. It will be isomorphic to the two times the matrix you use modulo N2. Uh, furthermore, so the main ingredient now is, is this fact. And another fact, if you take two curves, there's always an isogeny between them uh, whose degree is actually co-prime to N2. Uh, which means that if you represent uh, the action of that isogeny uh, <clears throat> with, with some fixed basis, you get an invertible matrix. So now if you want to get a specific action of the N2 version, which is again represented by a matrix uh, Two times the matrix. Then what you do is you you take this m psi and then you precompose it with m psi inverse times that particular action, which you do have because the the endomorphism ring module n two contains all the matrices. So now you can can actually get any type of action with the n two version. Furthermore, you can you'll get each action once because you only have a n two to the four possibilities uh, as an action. 
<clears throat> because every isogeny is a linear combination of these phi i. And what only ma matters is the, the residue class of the xi when you have n2. So you only have n2 to the four choices. You, you get them, each of them, so there's only one, uh, one particular choice for Okay, and uh, now uh, if you know these xi modulo n2, how does it help uh, in finding phi? So the main idea is, is, is if you use LLL, LLL has a feature that uh, <clears throat> if you have a short vector in the lattice, it is actually, uh, if you uh, write it in the spaces, the coefficients corresponding to the basis vector are also relatively short. And this ensures that uh, Using this fact, you can uh, actually prove that certain settings or uh, certain conditions are satisfied, which is that n1 over n2 is smaller than d over 16, where d is the shortest isogeny between the two curves. Uh, <clears throat> that you can you can recover the xi as integers as well, because you can show that xi uh, will just be in the inter interval minus n2 over 2 and n2 over 2. And there's only one residue there. Uh, so every residue module n2 only appears once there. So if you know the xi module n2, you know it as an integer as well. And this condition n1 over n2 being smaller than d over 16 is not very restrictive because you can actually assume that uh, n2 is bigger than n1 since you're attacking a key exchange. You can, you're, you're attacking the shorter one. But it is actually even tells even more that you don't even really need to utilize all the torsion information as usually d. In general, it's roughly squared to the field. So this essentially uh, works for any SIDH type scheme. Uh, interestingly, we never use the fact that n1 is smooth. Of course, if you want the isogeny as a rational map, you need n1 to be smooth. But uh, <clears throat> what this algorithm actually does is, is returns a linear combination of these phi i. Uh, so you can retrieve this linear, linear combination even if the, the isogeny is not of smooth degree. So to summarize, we generalize the GPSC effect to a much larger class of SIDA style schemes utilizing the torsion point information. Furthermore, we provide an algorithm for evaluating non-smooth degree isogenies between two curves of known endomorphism rings, uh, which might be of independent interest. So finally, this, this work uh, provides uh, uh, an attack on B side, which is more efficient than meeting the middle. Uh, not in terms of running time, it has the same running time, but it is completely memory free uh, compared to uh, meter middle algorithms, which uh, need exponential memory. And it is actually asymptotically much faster than for attacks. So it doesn't lead to an attack on B side because B side printers were actually uh, chosen very carefully uh, to avoid these types of attacks. But uh, it shows that you cannot lower B side parameters, which is an important fact because uh, uh, B side, if you if you if you can choose smaller primes uh, for for B side, then the efficiency of B side uh, <clears throat> gains a lot as you can choose n one and n two to be much smoother, and the prime also gets smaller. But uh, this attack shows that uh, this would be very unsafe. Thank you much for your attention.